is a 27 News Decision 2008 special presentation. The Kansas 2nd Congressional District runs north to Nebraska, east to Missouri, and south to Oklahoma, spanning 26 counties, including the cities of Manhattan, Leavenworth, Topeka, Parsons, Pittsburgh, and part of Lawrence. Current Representative Democrat Nancy Boyda stunned not only Kansas, but the nation with her victory in 2006 over incumbent Jim Ryan. Now two Republicans want to represent their party and take back the seat from Boyda. Jim Ryan, former Olympian and 2nd District Congressman. Making sure people have lower taxes, uh, making sure immigration is taken care of. And Lynn Jenkins, Kansas State Treasurer and former member of the Kansas House and Senate. They're frustrated. They feel like Washington has failed them. Both candidates have been campaigning hard all summer for the August 5th primary. And now it's time for their first televised debate. 27 News and the Topeka Capital Journal present a Republican primary debate between Jim Ryan and Lynn Jenkins. Good evening and welcome to the second district congressional debate between former Congressman Jim Ryan and State Treasurer Lynn Jenkins, who are both on the ballot in the Republican primary to be held Tuesday, August 5th. I'm Megan Farley. And I'm Bob Beatty. The rules for tonight's debate are few and pretty simple. Both candidates will take questions from Megan and I, as well as questions submitted from 27 News viewers and readers of the Topeka Capital Journal. Plus, each candidate will get to ask each other one question. And we're reserving a portion of the last section of the debate for your questions. So during the first 30 minutes of this debate, send in a question for both candidates. You can send that to debate at ksnt.com, and we may use your question at the end of the debate. We will allow six minutes total for each question. Each candidate will answer each question and then have a chance for a short rebuttal. Discussion on the topic can continue, but it will be at the moderator's discretion. Now we'd like to introduce our candidates with us. We have State Treasurer Lynn Jenkins and former Congressman Jim Ryan. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank Thanks for having, having us. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Now we're going to... Uh, we're going to begin. Our first question tonight comes from the 27 News staff. It's a bit of a long one. I'm going to read it here. And the nominee for president from the Republican Party, John McCain, said that the Republican Congress of the 2000s, quote, spent money like a drunken sailor, although I never saw, never knew a sailor drunk or sober with the imagination of my colleagues, end quote. But while many voters may not like excessive federal spending, they do want federal money for projects in their districts. So how do you plan to tackle the problem of federal spending while also taking care of the second district? Mr. Ryan, you're first. Megan, thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, one of the things that we need to do is control spending in Washington. I have voted for a balanced budget amendment. Uh, I believe that Washington needs to control the spending. As I talk to people throughout the second district, uh, you know, that's one of their concerns about waste, fraud, abuse, uh, excessive government spending. I went on to the budget committee to do what I could to control that. Uh, and made some very strong motions uh, and votes uh, against bills that spent more than was actually in the budget. So, you know, my position is I agree, you know, there's been too much spending, uh, and I voted uh, to eliminate as much of it as possible. All right. Ms. Jenkins? Um, well, I, too, agree with those comments, and that's, in fact, one of the reasons I'm running. Um, I'm just very frustrated with the spending that went on, and God love him, Jim Ryan was right there during that time doing that. And that's why I'm determined to get to Washington as a CPA. I think I have something to offer when it comes to addressing budgetary issues, especially pork barrel spending. I've signed a pledge to fight pork barrel spending because, in my estimation, when we send a dollar of our hard-earned tax money to Washington and it cranks through that bureaucracy, we just get pennies on the dollar back in free stuff. And it's as if they're trying to buy our votes. How about we just keep that dollar here and decide how best to spend it rather than have it go through that process? Uh, we have time for follow-ups. Congressman Ryan, uh, I know you have something to say here, but isn't there a bit of a conundrum in that uh, voters actually like uh, money that comes back to their district, and, if, and if we also know they don't like the spending? So how does a congressman? You know, Bob, get it's interesting that? because as I've gone door to door throughout the second district in my Kansas Valley tour, that was one of the issues that was constantly asked of me. Uh, first of all, they want lower taxes. I have worked on lower taxes in 2001 and 2003. Uh, making the child tax credit go to $1,000, eliminating the marriage tax penalty, the death tax. 
And more and more people are saying, we want to eliminate earmarks. I have taken the pledge to eliminate earmarks. I believe it's the way we need to go. Congress needs to tighten its belt because everyone else is doing that as well. And Kansas is, is no exception to that. So until we do that, uh, we're not on the right fiscal policy at this point. But when given the opportunity and Congress, um, Representative Ryan consistently voted for many of these pork barrel spending projects on straight up or down votes on things like a tomato farm, a swimming pool, a, an aquarium. He said yes to spend our money that way. So it just seems kind of odd now um, to, to change course. And, and I, I think voters need to understand um, why the change in position. Well, there's not a change in position. Quite honestly, I have worked on stripping out measures. Uh, seldom do you have a straight up or down vote. Uh, and so you, you really don't understand the characteristic of a vote in Washington. But I, I worked hard on that. In fact, I was recognized for my leadership in taking care of bills that had additional spending. Uh, and so you know, I stand by that, and my record is clear on that. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to post on my website the straight up or down votes that you've taken here. A million dollars for a locomotive demonstration in Pennsylvania. A million dollars for a mystic aquarium in Connecticut. You know, um, these are straight up or down votes, Congressman. I, I beg to differ with you on that, and we'd be happy to look at the bill because <laughs> okay. very seldom do you have a straight up or down. Bob, you know that usually what's put together is an appropriation bill with lots of different characteristics in it. You know, if you vote against the bill, for example, it might be transportation, taking money out of Kansas for bridge like the Topeka Boulevard Bridge. Uh, sometimes things are stuck inside that you hate to see there, but you need to make sure that you end up uh, voting what's right for Kansas. But and these just, were straight up or down. I'm yes sorry, or Lynn, no? they weren't. Thank you. Well, well, we'll have, you disagree on that one, and we'll... Well, we that's a matter of fact, though, whether they were straight up or down votes. So, um, I'm disappointed. Shall we move on to the next question? Let's go to the next question. Okay, well, we've got another question here. <laughs> this following is actually pre-taped. It's a, a video question from Samantha, and it is on the topic of illegal immigration. Hi, I'm Samantha. I've read on both of your websites about your concern for illegal immigration. And though illegal immigration does have its dangers and drawbacks, we also know that illegal immigrants many times underpin the Kansas economy by taking jobs that are otherwise difficult to fill. How do you propose that we fill these jobs in the absence of illegal immigrants? And Ms. Jenkins, you can begin. All right. Well, illegal immigration is a topic that is on a lot of voters' minds yeah. this year. and. Um, it's not um, the fact that we have immigrants here. It's the fact that they're here illegally, and it's an issue of national security. And we just can't simply choose which laws we're going to uphold and which ones we aren't. And I'm disappointed that both government um, run by Republicans and government run by Democrats at the national level have not addressed the issue. They've allowed 12 million illegal immigrants to come into our nation unchecked and it's time that we did something doing nothing is no longer an option and so i would like to see us immediately secure the border stop the hemorrhaging um, and then a second line of defense can be our businesses they're not coming to america because we're charming they're coming here because they need those jobs um, and if we could give businesses the tools that they need to check to see whether they're here legally or illegally, I think we can um, make strides in addressing this issue. You know, my position is that we, I put together a very strong uh, immigration bill that uh, had uh, nowhere in there, had absolutely no amnesty. Uh, and I believe it was the right thing to do. Uh, it would provide for a border, it would provide to the kind of money for border security patrol. You know, it is an ongoing problem. The question was, how does it affect jobs? There are people out there that want these jobs. I spoke with an individual who was a landscaper. Uh, he was troubled by the fact that he found out later he had illegals working for him. Uh, he fired them, went to work for one of his competitors. Uh, at the same time, he didn't have any trouble filling those jobs. So I don't think you're going to have a problem filling the jobs. Uh, I believe that Americans want to work. I see that throughout the 2nd District. That's one of the, the rich heritage of the 2nd District, is you have a very good workforce with very good work ethics. Uh, but we, I guess a lot of people do ask the question is how were estimates of 8 to 12 million illegal immigrants basically allowed to come into this country over the last 15 years uh, and when the federal government didn't do anything. And uh, we'll start with, with uh, Ms. Jenkins. Well, it's because Congress kept voting for amnesty. That's why. Well, 
but wh how were these uh, illegal immigrants actually allowed to physically come across the border without the federal government deciding to stop them? I, I, I have worked on uh, putting a border fence up. Uh, I have actually gone down to the border where the fence has been in place, uh, talked to the border security guards, and they will tell you on both sides of the fence, uh, crime has dropped. Uh, where the fence is up is working very well. But we've not completed the fence. In fact, if you go to the current congresswoman's record, uh, she has actually voted to defund some of that. So we need to finish the fence, and until we do that, we're not securing the borders. I, I, guess, I guess I'm going to press on this. For the last 10, 15 years, illegal immigrants have been coming across the border. How are they allowed to keep coming across without the federal government stopping them? What's the dynamic? I mean, there's a, there's a number of theories. One theory is that business really wants those jobs to be taken by illegal immigrants because they're cheap labor. And so does that mean then that business has an undue influence on the federal government that, that did not mandate that there would be something done about that? We'll I don't believe so. I believe most businessmen and women, especially here in the great state of Kansas, want to follow the law. And if they were given the tools, they would follow the law. Um, we have um, just such wonderful people here in the state of Kansas. They're not looking to hire illegal immigrants. Bob, I have worked on the immigration bill that was in the House. I was recognized, recognized nationally for my work because it was a tough immigration bill. It was so tough that the Senate wouldn't touch it and the President wouldn't touch right. it. And so, you know, that's what we need. We need a strong uh, piece of legislation that does not allow for any amnesty. I don't believe in amnesty, but I believe the fence is a part of the solution to that. And so through the years, because of the procrastination that's taken place, yes, they've come in, but it's not as a result of lack of work on my part. I spent a lot of years working on that bill, and I'm proud to say that I was recognized for my work for that. Why do you think the Senate doesn't want to touch a tough bill like that? What's going on in Washington? I think it's more game playing. You know, we can take all the votes you want, but at the end of the day, it's about results. And the fact is, the Republican-controlled Congress and the current Democrat-controlled Congress is not getting the job done. We need some leaders to step up to the plate and address these issues. I think it's important to have that leadership as well, and that's what I did when I was there. I made sure that we had a very tough uh, amnesty, or no amnesty bill, uh, making sure we address the illegal immigrant issue and make sure that we secure the borders. You know, I helped working with uh, Congressman Hunter, who was in the Armed Services Chairman, uh, putting together the fence that was along the border. Where it's been built, it's been very successful. It has worked on keeping illegals out, and I believe that's the direction we need to go. All right. Megan? Very good. Well, um, this week and last, we were taking emails from viewers and from readers of the Capitol Journal. So the next question that I have for you from a viewer says, what can you, if elected as a member of Congress, do about the economic challenges faced by members of the second district, namely the mortgage crisis, the increase of failing banks and lenders, and the multi-billion dollar quarterly losses by pension holders of stock from Merrill Lynch, Citigroup, et cetera, et cetera. And we are going to start with Jim Ryan. Yes. Megan, thank you. Uh, I began working on a measure on one of my committees, which is the Financial Services Committee, uh, recognizing that this problem was coming. Uh, it addressed the issue of uh, Freddie and Fannie, uh, and the issue of mortgages. Uh, it addressed the issue of more oversight. Uh, it addressed the issue of, of uh, wanting to have more oversight from the standpoint of making sure some of the problems that develop now would not. It passed out of the House, but the Senate and the President did not pick it up. So that was a piece of legislation. I think it was H.R. 1461. Some results we got there. <laughs> We can do better. Um, this issue of economics is, I think, the issue this election cycle. And it's, it's a broad issue, one where um, I think folks are skittish about the tax situation. And the Democrat-controlled Congress has already voted for, like, three budgets that dismantle those tax cuts. Um, as a small business person, I understand what that does when that, um, the threat of the largest tax increase the nation's ever seen is hanging out there. And so the best thing we can do is return some common sense um, when it comes to fiscal affairs to Washington and be determined and set on making those tax cuts permanent, eliminating the death tax, the alternative minimum tax at the individual and the corporate level, uh, making the marriage tax penalty and the child tax credit permanent. And then once you address that side of the ledger, we have to address the spending side of the ledger because it's the debt situation, whether it be the housing program or credit card debt 
or the national debt that is creating so much uncertainty in a global uh, marketplace. And the value of our dollar has taken a hit. And it's because we have run the national debt up to nearly $10 trillion. When Jim started, it was about $5 trillion. And rather than do the, the tax and spend that Democrats usually do, Republicans borrowed and spent, ran the national debt up over $9 trillion. We have to address that because our, that's the legacy that we're leaving to our children. And I don't know about you have kids. We do everything possible to help our kids and then to um, leave them a $10 trillion deficit as if they're never going to have a national disaster of their own to pay for or a war of their own to prosecute. We're handing them ours. Let's go to Mr. Ryan. You know, I, I, tax relief does need to be made permanent. And in addition to the uh, taxes that were highlighted, uh, small business tax relief, a number of those measures in 2001 and 2003 that were passed, uh, faster depreciation, a whole uh, summary of those, uh, it's important to make those permanent. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important to recognize what I was willing to do while I was there. I voted against my own party and against my own president when it was appropriate against measures that uh, would increase spending uh, and increase authorization. No Child Left Behind, Medicare Part D. Uh, under Lynn's leadership, uh, when she was in the state legislature, uh, she voted with her leadership to increase taxes 12 times. Gas taxes. We're paying more for gas now than we would be paying if she hadn't voted for gas increases, uh, for sales tax, expanding the death tax. Uh, that's not the kind of leadership that they want to send to Washington. You have to be willing to stand up and say, not on my watch. I was willing to do that, and I will continue to do it should the 2nd District put me back in as their congressman. Chris Jenkins, follow up to that. Yeah, obviously I take exception to that. You know, he, he fails to mention all of the tax cuts that we were able to get through in the Kansas legislature. And it was thanks to the unfunded mandates that Jim Ryan and the federal um, Congress passed down to the states that left us in a terrible pinch during my tenure in the legislature. Um, I think we did the responsible thing. We balanced our budget. We didn't leave our kids a deficit the way that he ran the national debt up. I think it's irresponsible. I think it's important to recognize what she did. It's a matter of record when she was a representative and senator that she did increase taxes uh, 12 times, uh, food taxes, uh, gas taxes, a death tax. All of those are a matter of record. So it's one thing to say something. We're in campaign season. Rhetoric is cheap, and you can say whatever you wish. You know, he fails to mention that he, too, voted for an 18 and a half cent gasoline tax um, continuation. So, you know... <laughs> Is that true? Uh, I, Bob, you know what? I'd like to see the record for that. And at this point in time, I would say to. that, you know, uh, you know, I voted to lower taxes. I was recognized by the National Taxpayers Union and others who recognize my hard work on lowering taxes. So uh, I think my record stands for itself. All right. Well, uh, coming up, the candidates will be asking each other questions, although they've already, I think, asked a few of each <laughs> other. And so we'll be right back with that. This Sunday, if you haven't seen the CW's number one comedy, get off the bench and get into the game. Don't be like me. I'm bitter, angry. I don't want to be like you. Me either. The game. Sunday night on the Northeast Kansas CW. Check out the hottest primetime lineup on the CW television network. Your local CW station is the Northeast Kansas CW. Kevin and I know that no one likes to think about death, let alone plan for it. One of the greatest gifts you can give to your loved ones is peace of mind, knowing that the decisions have already been made. At Kevin Brennan Family Funeral Home, we'll walk you through the prearrangement process and show you ways to plan a service that reflects your personal style. Call and stop by to experience the peace and tranquility up on the hill at 29th and Urish Road. Let our family care for your family with a Brennan at every service. You hear it every year. Cold winter, high energy costs. And it's true. Energy efficient windows and siding quickly pay for themselves. But why do other companies charge so much? You owe it to yourself to call Home Improvement Gallery. Locally owned with over 30 years experience, we offer a great selection of quality products, including replacement windows by Anderson at a price you can afford. Call Home Improvement Gallery today, 357-4042, for your free no obligation estimate. And let us help you start saving today. Family Service and Guidance Center of Topeka helps thousands of children and families live happier, healthier lives each year. Our wide range of mental health services can help. 
whether it's succeeding in school or getting along better with family. And the children and families we help look a lot like yours. If we can help you or someone you care about, we're here for you. Call Family Service and Guidance Center today because every child deserves a happy childhood. Welcome back to the first televised Republican primary debate for the 2nd District between Jim Ryan and Lynn Jenkins. I'm Megan Farley. And I'm Bob Beatty. In this segment of the debate, we turn the tables a little bit and allow the candidates to ask each other a question. But first, you still have a chance to email us one of your own questions. So you can just send that question to debate at ksnt.com. We may read your question here possibly at the end of the debate. So we have been alternating throughout the debate. Uh, Jim Ryan is actually the first to ask a question of Lynn Jenkins. So Jim, go ahead. Megan, thank you. Yeah. Lynn, my question will focus on one of the issues that I hear throughout the district as I've gone door to door. Now that John McCain is the presumptive, Repu presumptive Republican nominee for president, how does your immigration plan compare with the plan offered by Senator McCain in the past? Um, my plan for immigration, I think I already outlined, um, and that is to secure the border immediately, get the fence completed, increase border security, um, and then after that, have give businesses the tools, a database that they can use to um, tell instantly whether an employee that they are about to hire is legal or illegal. And how does that compare to John McCain's plan? Um, his was a little more um, liberal than that one, and, um, you know, I, I think we can tighten it down a little bit. Let me do a, a quick follow-up on that. I, I think uh, in, in terms of immigration, a big question is what do we do with illegal immigrants that are in the United States right now? And uh, I don't know if that's liberal or what that's termed, but the idea of what do you do with, with families? Do you, you know, deport them but leave a child that's born here? How do we get around that issue of the actual millions of illegal immigrants that are in the country right now? Uh, and I'll start as a follow-up with uh, Jim Ryan. Thanks, Bob. Well, as I've talked to people throughout the 2nd District, uh, the one thing I've heard with resounding force is do not reward the illegals uh, with, uh, you know, bad behavior. Uh, you know, what I hear and I believe is the right thing is that those who have come in legally need to be rewarded those that have come in illegally need to go to the back of the line. Uh, so it's real simple. It's very complicated, maybe, but as a result of, of what I'm hearing, I believe that is a message the 2nd District would like for me to carry back to Washington for them. And I would agree. You know, I think we could start right off the bat by locating the ones that are in our prisons. <laughs> and those could probably be sent home immediately. And then past that, we're going to have to do some kind of comprehensive approach to how to, how to uh, address the remaining illegals so uh so if there is a family that's illegal but there's a child that's born in the united states what do we do bob i stick to what i've been hearing is that you reward those that have come in legally and you do not reward those so, that have come here illegally it's so a we, we send them back yes is that right mm -hmm. okay i believe it's uh miss jenkins yep. turn to ask a question all righty part of the debate yep. Um, Jim, you've repli repeatedly denied that you voted for amnesty for illegal immigrants, but according to the congressional record that I have here, you voted for amnesty at least four times. So are you saying the congressional record is wrong? And if not, why did you support amnesty? Lynn, I do not support amnesty, have not voted for amnesty. It's a distortion of my record. Uh, I was recognized nationally for my work on the immigration bill that went through the house where there was no uh, amnesty involved in the bill so uh, i stand by my record uh, you can cherry pick if you'd like to but uh, it can be a distortion as well as what you've been doing but the con I, I, it's not my distortion it's in the congressional record i i, I stand by what i said so this is a particular <laughs> vote that four of them and how and are you why are you characterizing this as amnesty because that's what the bills are for. Um, the first one extends the deadline for application to the 245I blanket amnesty program and expands the guidelines so that more illegal aliens qualify for the program. Jim Ryan's a yes. 
The second one is among other amnesty provisions for families of illegal immigrants. This bill gave blanket amnesty for aliens who had maintained a physical presence in the United States for a given period of time. Jim Ryan votes yes. The third one allows illegal aliens arriving from Haiti to apply for readjustment of status to a legal permanent residence. Jim Ryan's a yes. And the final one was allows illegal aliens arriving from Nicaragua and Cuba to apply for readjustment of status to a legal permanent resi resident. And Jim voted yes, and then he sits here and says he didn't vote for him. You know, Bob, you know as well as I do the measures that are in Washington. Seldom you have an up or down vote. Uh, I have not supported amnesty, will not. These bills generally are wrapped up inside of something else, often a Democrat motion, Democrat measure. Uh, so I stand by my uh, position that my record is being distorted, as uh, many who have, have looked at this would say the same thing. You have not voted for amnesty, uh, and you have a strong record on supporting a very tough uh, immigration bill coming out of the House. All right, Megan, we have, a, uh, we have right. a video question. All right, well, we actually, for our next question, have another video. The following question comes from Lee, and it has to do with the topic of energy. Ms. Jenkins, you will be the first to okay. answer the question. So if we could go ahead and hear from Lee. Hi, my name is Lee. Uh, my question is, uh, the development of energy sources other than foreign oil has become a huge issue in the United States. Um, what are your viewpoints on uh, the development of alternative energy sources like wind farms, ethanol, and biodiesel? Uh, because these energy sources would have a huge impact on the agriculture uh, industry in Kansas. Uh, how do you view, view their development and um, how might you promote them? Okay, you begin. Another huge issue. Yes, yeah. very big. And uh, one that is again frustrating that Republicans and Democrats haven't ad uh, addressed this issue. I think Bush proposed an energy policy maybe six years ago and it has yet to be dealt with. Um, I think if I can get to Congress, there is a solution uh, that can be had, and I am happy to lead the effort. I think we can all agree that we need to um, cease being reliant on foreign sources of oil. And if we're going to do that, we need to come at it from a multi-pronged approach. Um, we need to drill immediately, um, increase domestic production. And we have the resources up in Anwar, in Alaska, offshore. We just need to start drilling. But that's not enough. We need to do as the um, young man suggested, and that is look at all our, our alternative sources of energy as well. Wind, solar, biodiesel, nuclear, coal. We need to look at all of these options and pursue them um, aggressively. And then we also probably need to look at giving automobile manufacturers some tax incentives to produce fuel-efficient vehicles, not in 10 years, but tomorrow. And then naturally, we all need to do our part in the area of conservation as well. And I think if we attack it um, from the all four corners, and um, this is a, a, a solution just you know waiting to happen. This is just a small little topic, which is you energy. Bet. Bob, it's a, it's a good topic because, again, as I've gone throughout the second district, this is the one that touches everyone's pocketbook. It is disposable income. They're very concerned about it. Uh, I have voted to explore already in Anwar. We would already be down the road on that if after it was passed, uh, President Clinton hadn't vetoed it. Uh, I believe in drilling offshore. I believe we need to develop our resources. Uh, I've also worked closely with Kansas State uh, in research development grants to explore alternative fuels biodiesel, biofuels. Uh, I believe that's the direction we need to go. I've also worked with them with regard to battery cell development. So, you know, my record is clear. I have fought hard for these, will continue to fight hard for them because I know that it's Kansas taxpayers' money. And that until we address this issue in an aggressive fashion, actually right now, the tide is turning some because there are those uh, radical environmentalists in Congress who are recognizing that, you know, they people home want to have lower fuel prices. So we need to explore our resources. In 1970, we had roughly a 20% dependency. Now we have roughly a 70% dependency. Uh, so we've gone the wrong direction. Uh, I would be honored to go back and continue to fight for uh, exploration uh, and continue the development of our natural resources, wind, solar, 
biomass, all of those that are available, and also work on ways to conserve. All of those are an essential part of solving this very complex and difficult problem. I might just remind viewers that um, when, when Jim was in Congress, when we had the presidency. We had control of the House and we had control of the Senate. We had all the political capital in the world. If we wanted to address an issue like this, that was the time to do it. Missed opportunity. Um, the opportunity was squandered. Um, God love you, Jim. Um, I think you've had your chance. I think it's time to send somebody else to Washington to address some of these issues. You know, Bob, all I can say is that I voted uh, the right way that we Kansans wanted me to vote. I felt I did a great job in that sense of making sure their views are represented. You really can't control what the president and the Senate do. And so I'm pleased and honored that I was able to do what I could along the way, showing leadership in those areas. I don't consider just casting yes or no votes leadership because you don't ever get anything accomplished other than to sit here and blame the president or the Senate. It's always somebody else's fault. Leadership is taking people where they don't want to go. And that is stepping up to the plate, being articulate, articulate enough to um, come up with an alternative solution and to bring people along. And um, voting no on things is not good enough. You need to step up and offer a solution that will work and, and sell it to your colleagues. Rhetoric is really cheap, Bob, especially at this time. Uh, it's easy to say what Lynn has just said, and yet when she was in leadership uh, in the Kansas State Legislature, she voted yes with her leadership to increase taxes 12 times. When given the opportunity to take a pledge for no tax increases, she wouldn't sign that. She has conveniently signed the one for the national, uh, when she's running for national office, but while she was a state legislator, there was no leadership. So saying yes to tax increases is not standing up for Kansas and making sure the wallet is protected. We have time. Well, um, the reason you can't sign a, a pledge when you're at the state level is because we were at your mercy, babe. <laughs> Oh, we were passing all of the unfunded mandates down on us. Um, and I know I called your office one time to ask about education. I said, this is not working. You're not meeting your obligation at the federal level. And you said, well, we don't want to fund it because it's broken. And I asked you that day, either fix it or fund it. And neither one of those things happened. And I voted against No Child Left Behind because it allowed federal bureaucracies to grow it really did not address the issue of Kansas and teachers. Uh, the concerns that I heard as I traveled through the 2nd District from teachers and administrators and parents was I didn't want to see uh, more federal bureaucracy come into the system. So I felt it was the wrong move at that point. Uh, again, we're avoiding the whole issue of what you did under your, your tenure, uh, the issue of, of not signing a pledge to raise taxes. You, and that really comes down to individual responsibility. Well, and, and no child left behind. That passed. You were a no vote, but where was the leadership? Where did you step up and say, how about we try this, Republicans? How about, we were how in about control. voting against your own party and your own president, expressing what the second district wanted to have, which was not having support for no child left What did behind. that get us? It got a no vote. You only have to make sure you make sure your vote is the correct vote. Oh, I disagree strongly. This is about leadership. Our nation needs leadership, and it needs it now, if ever. And we need to send folks to Washington who are going to stand up, park the partisan politics at the door if necessary, roll up their sleeves and find solutions to problems, not sit there and just vote yes or no. Kansans deserve better than that. That will be a decision made by Kansans when we get through this primary. Okay. Uh, really, really quick question. We do have time in this segment. Yes. We'll keep it maybe to just one answer if we have time. Uh, a short, a short time ago, a few months ago, Congress and President Bush uh, approved stimulus checks for an economic boost. Boost. A number of people said that the money just got sent to Saudi Arabia for gas and China for a lot of toys, probably. Uh, did you agree with the stimulus check program, and or are there better ways to boost the economy in the short term? Uh, I can't remember where we are, but we'll start with... Bob, Mr. thank Ryan. you. Uh, in 2001, after 9-11, uh, I helped put together a, a small stimulus package that did provide similar to the stimulus package that you've just seen. It's, it's a short-term fix. It is not going to fix the economy. Quite honestly, you need to send the message of making tax relief permanent, 
Uh, that's why through the years, 2001, 2003, I helped work with a Congress that passed good tax legislation, again, raising the child tax credit from $500 to $1,000, elimination of the marriage tax penalty, elimination of the death tax, lots of different small business tax relief, small businesses, the engine of our economy, all of that is essential. So to me, that's a better approach. This Congress could do a lot to reduce the uh, and, and diminish the, the lack of confidence in where this economy is going by making tax relief permanent. It is not permanent at this point in time. I'm going to make Jim stay. I'm going to agree with him. Um, I'm always suspect of politicians in Washington giving away free money in an election year. It kind of reeks as if our votes are for sale. There is a bigger issue, and it's one to, you know, a, a address the bigger issues in Washington. All right. Well, stay with us. Coming up, we'll put out a question or two from the emails that you've been sending in yeah, during we, the debate. We got plenty. We want to thank everybody for sending those emails. Yes. They just kept coming, and we probably got even some more in there that we should probably check out soon. So we'll take a look at those when we come back. Stonehouse Animal Hospital has expanded, making it an advanced and unique center for compassionate pet care in Northeast Kansas. We've handpicked a team of veterinarians with special talents. Stonehouse is open 24 hours a day for routine care and emergencies. Rest assured knowing if something happens with your pet in the middle of the night or you just need a checkup, there's always a veterinarian available ready to help. Your pet deserves the love and support of the whole team at Stonehouse Animal Hospital, dedicated to helping your pet live a long and happy life. Stop the clock. Merle Norman's new lightweight foundation is an age-defined breakthrough. With Flawless Effect Liquid Foundation SPF 15, every silky drop bites off fine lines with powerful antioxidants and skin-loving botanicals. Optical diffusers help veil flaws no one needs to see. Ask for your perfect shade of Flawless Effect. Merle Norman, discover your beauty. Schedule your appointment today for a complimentary skincare analysis. When it's time to buy new tires for your car or light truck, where do you go? You have many options, but next time, consider Greg Tire. Greg Tire is local, family operated, and has been for over 90 years. Greg Tire invests in the local community. Greg Tire employees are experienced and well qualified. Greg Tire offers competitively priced tires with our low price guarantee. Greg Tire, it's where to go. Our experience goes a long way. Go where the winners go, because 38 Special is coming to Golden Eagle Casino. I can't live without you. I'm so proud of you. Just hold on to Two 38 Special shows Friday, August 29th. Get tickets online at GoldenEagleCasino.com or call 888-GO-FOR-LUCK, extension 258. I want you back where you belong. Ask about VIP seating for 38 Special Friday, August 29th at Golden Eagle Casino, Horton, Kansas. And welcome back. This next question comes from a viewer named Owen, and Mr. Ryan will be the first to answer this question. Hello, my name is Owen, and I have a question for the two of you this evening. I'd like to know, since both of you have such similar views on the issues, being against um, the death tax and against amnesty for illegal aliens, and for cutting government spending, and for making President Bush's tax cuts permanent, when we get into the voting booth, why should we choose you? Okay, there you go. Ms. Ryan, would you like to begin? Megan, thank you. And Owen, thank you for your question uh, related to the death tax and taxes in general. Uh, during my time that I was in Congress, I worked on making sure Kansans kept more of their hard-earned money. As a member of the Budget Committee, I could see where monies were coming in. I also see, also see that uh, there was overspending. So I voted against a lot of measures that had overspending. But I also voted to increase uh, the child tax credit, uh, the marriage tax penalty, uh, making sure that we eliminate the marriage tax penalty, and also eliminate the debt tax. Again, a lot of small business tax relief. And that's a clear distinction between myself and Lynn. When I had the opportunity for leadership, I stepped up to the plate. Uh, I worked with uh, the appropriate committees, uh, made sure we did the right things along the way to get tax relief in. When given the opportunity under Lynn's leadership, when she was a state, state legislator, she voted 12 times to increase taxes. In fact, she's voted three times to increase, increase gas taxes. That's a matter of record. What you need is a strong voice that will go when uh, it's necessary to stand up and make sure Kansas votes are heard, voice uh, values are heard, and make sure you vote against tax increases. It's tough, but it's the right thing to do, again, because Washington has more than enough of your money. And I believe that uh, our records are quite different on this particular issue. Um, well, 
I think Kansans really do appreciate their roads and bridges. And um, I'm proud to have support, supported the comprehensive transportation plan when I was in the legislature. And if there were some gas taxes, some user fees involved, I still don't think they add up to the 18 and a half um, sent a gallon that you supported. But I think the question that Owen had was, if we're similar on many issues, what is the main reason why somebody should go in the voting booth and vote for Lynn Jenkins? And at the end of the day, I think it's just real simple. Um, Jim Ryan served us in Congress for 10 years. I feel like he had his chance and it's time for someone else to step up to the plate. Um, he lost to a Democrat in a district where Republicans outnumber Democrats nearly two to one. Um, almost statistically impossible for that to happen. And if I thought for a minute that he could return this seat to Republican hands, I wouldn't be here. But I'm concerned about the um, current congresswoman representing the second district. I don't think she is politically in step with this district. And I would like to see this return to Republican hands. I think Republicans have a, a challenge ahead of them. I think our brand is wounded. And probably rightly so. We blew it. I'll be the first to recognize that. But if we're going to rebuild the party here in Kansas and at the national level, we can't do it by sending the same people back to Washington that made the mistakes in the first place. And so I'm excited to be a part of a new Republican movement, one that is sent to Washington with a mandate to get it right this okay, time. Mr. Ryan. Bob, I would address this back to Owen. Owen, what you're looking for is strong leadership that is willing to listen to the concerns in the second district and make sure they're represented. I know when I first started on my Kansas Values Tour, I had a reporter that asked me, he said, what are you going to tell people at the door? And I said, I'm not going to tell them anything. I want to hear what their concerns are. And they're concerned about leadership as well. Uh, you have to be willing to stand up for Kansas values and Kansas votes. Uh, I was willing to stand up against my own president, against my own leadership, uh, when it was in the best interests of Kansas uh, in the second district. My record is clear on that. There's a huge difference here. I was willing to say no. Again, uh, Lynn was willing to say yes to all of the tax increases. Uh, that's not what you want. We don't need to send more money back to Washington. We need to send less there because they have more than enough of your money. We have time for follow-up, but let me frame the follow-up a little differently. This is obviously a Republican primary, as, right. as you mentioned. Uh, Republicans will be voting August 5th. And I think you mentioned something that we, we have a little time to talk about. How will each of you... Uh, defeat Nancy Boyer. That's what Republicans really uh, do want to know. You mentioned it a little bit, and then maybe Mr. Ryan can talk about that, too. Okay. Um, well, again, I don't think it's statistically possible to have a Democrat represent this district. They just um, are politically out of step with the district. And yet there is one. And yet there is one. And what I have heard up and down the district is um, that Republicans didn't vote for Nancy Boyer. They voted against my friend Jim because they wanted a change. They didn't like the direction the country was headed. Um, I don't think they're particularly pleased with the representation that they're getting today and if given another option, one that um, agrees with them on the majority issues of the day, they will take it. And you know, I've done a lot of number crunching before I, I ever jumped in this race and went back and evaluated the results of the last election cycle. And um, in the primary campaign, Jim Ryan and Lynn Jenkins were both unopposed in our Republican primaries last cycle. And generally folks that top the ballot get the most votes in a campaign because they run every two years and spend millions of dollars getting their message out and their name out. But last time in the Republican primary, the state treasurer, down ballot state treasurer candidate got more votes than our congressional candidate did. Unlike the other districts in the big first and the fourth, they got about 10% more votes than I did in those districts. And I think that's telling. I think people, Republicans, the most conservative Republican primary voters chose to vote for no one rather than supporting Jim. And I don't know what he does two years out of office that he didn't do 10 years in office to win those people okay, back. let's go to Mr. Ryan. Bob, thank you. You know, it was an interesting time after my loss last time. 
Then I started having the phones ring. I started having people stop by. Uh, and I began going on a little bit of a listening tour. One of them was in Manhattan, Kansas. I went in to talk about the last election, and their response was, we don't want to talk about the last election. We want to talk about how winning, how you can win this again. The support has been great. Our polling numbers show that we have a 40-point lead. I don't expect it to hold because of the distortion of my record as we continue down this road. But what they're looking for is good, strong, honest leadership. And that's why the current congresswoman is not right. She doesn't reflect Kansas values. She doesn't reflect Kansas votes. Or one of her very first votes was to take away what is a sacred privilege in this country, and that is a secret ballot for union workers. Mm -hmm. It was a vote called car check. Uh, she chose to take away the vote. If you were the union boss and I was under you, you could tell me how to vote. Uh, she ended up uh, working through uh, taking away money from BRAC, which was an important part of, of the function in the state. So, you know, those are the kind of votes she walked out on a, an armed services hearing where a four-star general was responding to the progress that was taking place in Iraq. You know, as a former war, war protester, she didn't really want to hear the truth of what was going on. I want to see our troops home as soon as possible, but I look to the generals on the ground to direct that. The current congresswoman is not listening to the 2nd District. She's wrong, and uh, I ask for everyone's vote on August 5th because that's what we're headed towards. All right, Megan. You, we have yes. some other emails yes. that have come in. We do. We have another email from a viewer, and they asked the question, do you support overturning Roe v. Wade? If so, would you vote for a federal law banning abortion? Mr. Ryan. You, you know, I, I am pro-life. Uh, I have the support of uh, the four pro-life organizations, one being Kansans for Life, uh, National Right to Life, Susan B. Anthony, and Concerned Women for America. I believe in the sanctity of life. And that's a distinction between myself and my opponent. Uh, she recently did uh, a pro-choice wish fundraiser in New York City and then tried to deny it, uh, at the same time posing as, as being a pro-lifer. So there's a clear distinction on this issue. Uh, my record through the years has been pro-life. Uh, there is a clear difference here. Ms. Jenkins? Um, talk about distortions. Let me just tell folks where I am on this issue, and they can um, make up their mind. When I was in the Kansas legislature, we had several... Um, bills r relating to abortion come before us. I voted to ban partial birth abortion, voted to restrict late-term abortions, voted to require parental consent, um, but I have three exceptions and um, stand by those. Well, uh, if Roe v. Wade was overturned, it's very possible Congress would would look to pass a bill to ban abortion nationwide versus it going state by state by state. Uh, would either of you like to answer whether you would vote for a federal ban on abortion if Roe v. versus Wade was overturned? You know, Bob, that would more likely go back to a state issue and the states would make that decision. I again go back to my position. I support... Uh, you know, certainly Congress line. would try. Uh, you, you, know, you may have the Supreme Court doing something with that as well, so I'm not real sure who's going to take the first step on that, but you know, I believe that a child has the right to live uh, I have voted to end partial birth abortion. Uh, you know, I've done a number. I've worked on a number of measures, and that's why I've been recognized by the various pro-life organizations for my work. Okay, we received a lot of emails on that topic, which is why we we asked it. I believe we have another video yes. question. Is that right, Megan? We do have a video question, and this is from Amy. Hi, Bob. Hi, Megan. Good evening, candidates. My name is Amy, and I want to know as we take a look at both of your track records. Could each of you please describe to me exactly a legislative bill that you have proposed and then what you did to get that bill passed? So, Ms. Jenkins, this would be a bill when you were in the state legislature that okay. you proposed and then uh, got passed. Okay. And just to make everyone crystal clear, I've never had an opportunity in Washington. Right. No, this would be in the state And so, yeah, there's a huge difference between um, federal government and state government. Probably the, the one thing I'm most proud of was my work on a bill, uh, a, a bill for Goodyear um, when I was in the Senate. Um, the last year I was there, they were at risk of leaving Topeka, and we put together a, a package of tax incentives. I was vice chair of the tax committee and was on the conference committee, and because it was in my backyard, I had the pleasure of working with um, the folks in the legislature to get that passed and to keep Goodyear here. Okay. Mr. Ryan? You know, I, I would reflect on, on my work for the military. I had a number of opportunities to help the military. One of them relates to the BRAC base realignment closure. When I went in 1996, uh, you were seeing the big red one leave Port Riley, uh, heading overseas. 
Uh, I began working with the Kansas delegation on the kind of infrastructure that would be needed to bring them back with regard to the ranges, housing, uh, health care, uh, so that when our service men and women were in harm's way defending the country, they could rest assured that everyone back home was being taken care of. So I would say that's one of my proudest achievements. It means a, an additional 10,000 jobs to Kansas, roughly $500 million. Uh, I have continued would continue to work on those issues. In fact, one of the issues that I worked on as I was leaving, which, by the way, was very bipartisan. I worked with uh, Representative Green from Texas in a unanimous fashion, fashion passing a bill that would have eliminated the discrepancy between low-income and low-income military because that particular housing issue was a major issue. It went through the financial services in such a way that it was so bipartisan it was unanimous. So those are the kind of issues I would have worked on and would like to continue to work on, making sure our military has everything they need as they continue the war on terrorism. I'm going to flip that a little bit and ask, if you are elected, uh, is, is there a specific bill that you will, you will go into Congress and personally propose because you may be frustrated with uh, what's being done in Congress and may, maybe not be happy with what would come up if it was written by somebody else. And actually, we'll start with Mr. Ryan because we started with Mrs. Jenkins. Well, you know, Bob, I don't, I, you know, I would continue working on making tax relief really permanent. Uh, I believe that that's the issue, uh, along with uh, being able to drill uh, offshore uh, in an Alaska. Those are the key issues. Again, going door to door, people are, are seeing their disposable income disappear. They want to see lower fuel costs. You know, the short-term measure is going and drilling in these various areas. It won't take 10 years. We're looking at four to six years. At the same time, we need to continue to work on alternative fuels, conservation, wind and solar. Uh, but I would continue to work on, on uh, lowering fuel costs, uh, making sure that BRAC, uh, not BRAC, but the uh, military has everything they need. We're still in the process of transitioning at uh, Fort Riley. Uh, so making sure they have the kind of infrastructure needs that they should have as the troops continue to come back, eliminating wasteful government spending, you know, all of those are essential, uh, you know, making sure that we push forward, making sure Kansas get more of their own hard-earned money back. Okay. And I, 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 too, would focus on the economic side of things. That's what I spent my entire professional career doing. Um, job one would be to make the bitch tax cuts permanent. Uh, job two would be to roll up my sleeves and go to work on this um, spending side of the ledger. Um, I th I, that's what I've done my entire life in private industry, in the... Kansas legislature and at the state treasurer's office, and um, I'm determined to go back and make a difference. Megan, we received some emails yeah. actually about foreign policy. Right. Okay. This question um, asks, how do you see Congress's role in foreign policy and war policy? Pretty easy question, and, but and, not well, so it, well, easy. Well, it's not so easy because this about, has come yeah. up because, uh, of course, in the Constitution, it says that Congress has the right to declare war. So what right. U.S. presidents have simply done is not declare war and then send our troops uh, overseas. So Congress does play a role, but in the last 40-some-odd uh, years, actually, Congress has played a very subsidiary role. Do you agree with this, or do you think that Congress should actually step up and take maybe a stronger uh, role in war policy and foreign policy? We'll start with Mrs. Jenkins. Well, I think definitely Congress is the, uh, the accountable body here. And um, what I don't appreciate is um, listening to Nancy Pelosi um, dictate foreign policy. And that's why Congress holds hearings. Um, both my opponents have been um, sitting there in those rooms and been privy to those conversations. And that is critical. And that's why one of the saddest days of my life was when Nancy Boyda got up and walked out on that retired military general. They call it a hearing for a reason. You're supposed to hear what they have to say and then take the knowledge that you gain and make the tough decisions. And if I'm in Congress, I, I think I'm going to be ready to do that. But you have to listen first to the folks who know how to prosecute war and protect our nation and secure our, our borders and then act accordingly. I believe Congress should take a more active role. Uh, I also feel that when we're addressing some of these foreign policy issues, especially if we look at North Korea and Iran, that we should be exhausting, uh, before we do anything else, uh, diplomacy. You know, uh, address, addressing that with as many people, I mean, as many nations as you can get to the table to put pressure on these countries to make them uh, draw back from their nuclear development. Uh, you know, they're really in a position with these rogue nations that as they continue down the path they're going, they become a much more serious threat. So, you know, certainly having Congress more active at the same time, making sure that we approach it from the standpoint of doing everything we can with regard to diplomacy before pursuing anything else. Sanctions may be appropriate, but they can't be unilateral. They need to be 
uh, nation joining nation to make this effective with any kind of uh, boycott, if that should be the case. Then an interesting email uh, that said, uh, asked the question of, what's the key personal trait that you think will help you be an effective member of Congress? I guess maybe this is sort of a personal question. Yeah. Is there something in your personality that uh, will help you uh, become a very effective member of Congress? I think we started, start with Mr. Ryan. Well, one thing that uh, I've been able to do is to work on Kansan's behalf uh, when it was appropriate, uh, making sure we had bipartisan work. I mentioned earlier the piece of legislation with regard to low-income housing, uh, the disparity over there, uh, making sure that we had good representation working on both sides of the aisle, and yet at the same time, when it was time to fight for tax relief, continue to fight for tax relief so that Kansans have more of their money. You know, that was a little bit difficult to get through because there's a lot of Democrats that believe that Washington should have more of your money. I don't believe that. And so being willing to know you know, how to lead from the standpoint of when it's important to work in a bipartisan fashion, but when to stand up and make sure that Kansas values are represented. You know, I will always stand for Kansas values and make sure they're represented, but making sure that you know, you know, when you can join forces and at the same time uh, when there's a line in the sand and you can't cross that. Ms. Jenkins? Um, I, would, I would think it would come back to leadership. Um, it seems like whenever I get involved in anything, um, I just go full steam ahead and want to find solutions, not just go along to get along. And one example is um, when I became state treasurer, I got involved in the National Association of State Treasurers, where we all come together to solve um, issues of, of you know, all common to the state treasurers. And I'm now serving as the president of the National Association of State Treasurers. And I think I'm the first Kansas state treasurer to ever serve in that role. But I think it's important when you see a challenge to step up and um, if you've got something to offer to try to make a difference. And that's what I'm doing here by running for Congress. I think I have something to offer. And um, I'm asking the folks in the second district to give me a chance to go back and try to make this world a little better. We have we have two minutes, so I guess about one minute each. You mentioned, you mentioned Kansas values. Uh, what are Kansas values, in your, your opinion? Well, let me just say this. As I've gone door to door, I hear Kansans saying they want to have lower taxes. I've been recognized for my fight over the years to fight for lower taxes. The child tax credit, elimination of the marriage tax, elimination of the death tax, fighting for small business tax relief. I've been given an A by the NRA. I have four major pro-life organizations that have endorsed me. I think my record is very clear, in spite of some of the distortions that you've heard today. So Kansans want to have someone that are willing to stand up, show leadership, but to do so with values that reflect the second district. So I ask for your vote on August 5th and your help from then until the November election. We can win this seat back, and it's important that we come together and fight to make sure the second district has their voice and their values returned. Mr. Jenkins? Um, well, I think the values of Kansans are um, just found in the faces of the individuals in every little small community up and down um, the 2nd District and across the state. And I've traveled the district um, day and night for the last year. Um, I've traveled the state um, the last six years as state treasurer. And these people work hard. And I think they're offended that um, folks in Washington don't work as hard as they do and aren't as responsible with their money as they are. If um, Congress was running a business or a farm operation, they would be bankrupt. And I think that's insulting to a lot of Kansans, and they want to see um, Washington step up to the plate and set an example. All right. Well, we're out of time. Megan? Yes. All right. So. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. It has been an hour, so uh, we would like to thank so much the candidates, Jim Ryan and then Jenkins, for being here, and the Topeka Capital Journal and all of our 27 news staff. And do not forget, the primary election, August 5th, a very very big day. So thanks once again for being here. For 27 News, I am Megan Farley. Have a great night. What are you doing this weekend?